Okay. We've got to do some tweaking of our organization. Matthew chapter 5 this morning. Matthew chapter 5. And when they go in, I'll share some things with you guys that I think are very encouraging. Matthew chapter 5. Good to see everybody here. Good to see Obed. Obed, are you still doing? Are you still being activated quite a bit right now, or are you back to normal? Back in school. Pretty back to normal. Pretty back to normal. Okay. He had to serve quite a bit. He's in. Uh, he's in the reserves. He's National Guard. Is there National yeah. Guard reserves? Yeah. So he was in the Keys after the hurricane. You guys may have noticed he's been missing a little bit, and so he's been doing that. But it's good to see you back, and uh, glad that you're here. Good to have everyone here today. A bunch of right wingers in our church. <laughs> you know, Charlie on the left and Jamancy and Joel. So, it is what it is, right? All right. Close that door. <laughs> about to talk about you guys, so we want you out of here. Some days, this is one of them, are just tough days. So we've, uh, uh, well, like I said, we were all out of, we were all gone yesterday, so we didn't do our normal bus visitation. I just want to tell you something, folks. It makes a big difference visiting people during the week. Just it affects our church, our attendance is down, and a lot of those things really matter. And I think it's important just to, to point those things out sometimes because sometimes we don't realize how much we matter in our church and how much you matter and just serving the Lord in the place that God has made you. But you can just tell a big difference. I always know when I've been gone for the week, I know, boy, things are going to be out of sorts on Sunday. And it isn't so much uh, it isn't so much what you do during the week. It's just like when you're gone, I don't know what it is, but things happen like that. There's something else like that. When you go door-to-door -door and you have good door-to-door -door on Tuesdays, uh, it's not always the same people that you visited, but you always have more visitors on Sundays. So God just blesses and works that way. There's just some mysteries in the church, things that I can't necessarily explain, but they're that way. But these kids that we've got right now are very, very precious. God has given us a whole bunch of new kids that are unsaved. We had uh, actually a neighborhood where Jamancy lives at. And he, Jamancy, how many years have you guys been coming from your neighborhood? Long time, right? Back when we were in the other building? Probably about eight years, I want to say. Six or eight years they've been coming on the bus. This last summer, the last kids in their little cul-de-sac, the part of their neighborhood that were lost, got saved this summer that had been coming that whole time. And then Jamancy's cousins all started coming like the next week. And so we got a bunch of new ones uh, that, are, that haven't been born again yet. But we just rejoice in that. It's just amazing how God works. just thrills our hearts. And you ever think about it, uh, a lot of children, you notice, they don't have parents coming with them to church. And so nobody teaches them how to sit, how to behave, how to not tear pages out of the Bibles how to not shred the seats on the bus and different things like this that you wouldn't know are a part of normal culture. And, uh, you know, it, we, that's, what, that's what we're doing. That's what we're training them for. And they're having church back there. You can hear them back there singing and they're learning how to behave in church and God's going to reach their hearts. And it's just such a thrill to watch kids come up and then become teenagers. We have got in our church some of the best teenagers in the world. And I'm not exaggerating. I'm just telling you, God is working in our teenagers. They love the Lord and they're growing spiritually. And it's just a wonderful thing to watch that process and to know that these kids are going to be there if we're faithful to them. And uh, God's, I mean, they're, they're going to be our future leaders. And so they've just got a ton of potential. We're just, we're looking forward to that. I hope you see things that way. Please don't be annoyed or bothered when, you know, it's hard to pay attention because there's distractions and that sort of thing. Uh, just, just step in if you can. Help somebody find something in the handbook or maybe if somebody's getting a little out of hand, just stand beside them and just sing in their ear until they start singing or whatever. It, just, it helps a lot. I have to do that with Brother Taj all the time, don't I, Brother Taj? So he behaves pretty well now, so anyway, we're doing really well. All right, now we're in the Scripture. It's 1230, and my goal is to not preach terribly long today. I shouldn't because... Uh, I preached half of the message last week, and we're going to preach the second half this week. 
And we're going to begin reading our text down in verse 17 in a very famous portion of Scripture that I actually think that most people actually know. And so here we are. We're going to begin reading verse 17 if you found your place. And then we'll pray and ask the Lord to help us with clarity of thought and just for the Spirit of God to speak to us. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come, not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Those are very, very strong words, aren't they? Let's pray and let's, help, let's, let's ask God to help us to understand and apply them, shall we? Father, we recognize from the Scripture today that there is much for us to learn, much for us to know. And God, we also recognize from the Scripture today that this passage of Scripture is not teaching the Gospel or salvation, but it is teaching discipleship. And so I pray that you would help us by way of perspective to know the truth of the Scripture in this matter. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, this is an orientation passage. We're in the middle of Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, actually as we're preaching through Matthew, and we're in the middle of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, right? Uh, some people call it the B-attitudes. Uh, the B-attitudes. These are the attitudes that you're supposed to be having or something like that. So that's what B-attitude means, right? <laughs> so the B-attitudes is what we're told. Um, these... Uh, this is a portion of the Scripture, actually, that I can't say enough about what's said wrong about. Because this really, though it's a sermon, this is not the Gospel that's being preached here. This is really Jesus orienting the disciples whom He's called, and He is literally telling them the mindset, the way to think, if you're going to be one of His disciples. Now, we know that Jesus had more disciples than just the twelve who were called to be apostles, don't we? So we know that this would be a larger crowd than the twelve apostles. Uh, we also know that this would not include everyone in the world at the time that believed in Jesus. This would not include all the disciples of John the Baptist or all the people who come to be baptized when John the Baptist preached the gospel, which was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? So we know that. Uh, unfortunately, this is a passage of Scripture where many people teach that Jesus is giving the Gospel. In other words, there's a book called The Gospel According to Jesus, and it is primarily taught out of Matthew chapter 5 and 6, explaining why most people who think they're going to heaven actually aren't, because they're not good enough. Their works don't measure up to the requirements that Jesus requires for discipleship. And I just want to draw a very clear distinction today by saying this. Jesus is not here preaching the gospel. He does that in John chapter 3 right, when he talks to Nicodemus about being born again. Jesus said in John 3, He said, Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So this is not Jesus explaining, this is how you can get to the kingdom of God. This is how you can be good enough to earn heaven. If any man could be good enough to earn heaven, the cross was an absolute farce. It would be an absolute waste of time. As is put in 1 Corinthians, our preaching is vain and your faith is also in vain and you are yet in your sins. That's what Paul said, if Christ be not risen. The whole message of the cross, Paul said, we'd be false teachers if the message of the cross, if, if the cross were not necessary and if the message of the cross were not true. My friend, the reason Jesus died on the cross, hear me now, the reason Jesus died on the cross is because we needed Him to. Because of sin. And discipleship does not do anything to merit or to negate our need for salvation. Being a disciple of Jesus is an altogether separate matter from being born again. And we have to make that distinction. These individuals whom Jesus is addressing are already believers... But not all, of them are, uh, not all of them actually are. There's one notable exception here, isn't there? 
Who are we thinking of? Judas. Judas. Was Judas born again? No. No. Was Judas a disciple? Yes. yes. Judas was a disciple, but Judas wasn't born again. My friend, discipleship is not the gospel. Discipleship is how a disciple follows. A disciple is one who is taught by the teacher or one who imitates or follows the teacher. And so as we began through the first introductory statements, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, uh, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, all of these things which are apparent paradoxes or apparent contradictions because they're not the way we think. How many people think it's a blessing to be poor? How many think it's a blessing to be meek? How many people think it's a blessing to hunger and to thirst after righteousness? How many people think it's a blessing to mourn? And as you examine each of these statements, you find that what the Lord Jesus says is in fact true, and His explanation is a perfect one for each of them. But it's not the way we naturally think. And friend, if you're going to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus, your thinking is going to have to be different than it would be if you're trying to uh, follow after the ways of the world or the thinking of the world. And so last week, uh, we, were, we saw that Jesus told the disciples that they were two things. They were the salt of the earth, and they were the light of the world. Now this week, Jesus is just dealing with, it's just a, sort of like a little caveat or parenthesis or a paragraph in the middle of a statement. And he's trying to help the disciples with their thinking about why he came. Why did you come, Jesus? He said, think not that I am come to destroy the law. I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. What was one of the major adversarial accusations that the Pharisees made against Jesus, particularly His disciples? Do you remember? Remember when they were walking through the field and His disciples plucked uh, corn uh, uh, and they, they were you know, rubbing out the husk in their hands and eating it? What did they say? They're not washing their hands. They're, yeah, they're not washing their hands. They're eating on the Sabbath day. You remember this? You remember when, um, well, we could go through instance after instance where Jesus was, His disciples were accused of ignoring or not fulfilling the law. And Jesus wants to help the disciples to understand something here. He's trying to help them understand that His purpose in coming was not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. My friend, this is one of the most significant passages of Scripture in the Bible to help you understand the purpose of the law in your life. Jesus came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Why? Because no man could ever fulfill the law. See, what is the purpose of the law? Let's go to Galatians real quickly, and let's look at an explanation of what the purpose of the law. If you go to Galatians in uh, ch uh, chapter 3, we'll see the purpose of the law. Let me ask you a question. Does anybody ever keep the law? No. Except for the rich young ruler, the rich young man that said that he kept it. I'm a little bit of a skeptic about that. I'm impressed if he did, but I have a hard time believing him. Um, Galatians chapter 3. Paul is talking to Judaizers, to people that are trying to make salvation the deeds of the law or the works of the flesh. That is, works that you physically do instead of the righteousness which is by faith in Jesus Christ. And actually, we don't have time to go through the whole discourse. That's a study of Galatians. You can study it in Romans as well. But Paul did say in chapter 2, in verse 15, "...we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law," but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now that's a mouthful, isn't it? This is one of the most important statements. I don't know how many times I've met somebody and I've inquired about their eternal life, their eternal destiny. I want to know if they know Jesus as their Savior. And they said something like, well, I do believe in Jesus, but the reason I'm going to heaven is because I'm a good person or I do good things. I knocked on, uh, I've knocked on doors a lot of times. I've met uh, important people in denominations. I met a man in an Episcopal church a couple of years ago, and I said, uh, let me just ask you a question. You know for sure you have eternal life? And he said, of course I do. I said, well, great. 
And I thought, well, that's, that's a good solid answer. You know, you like it when somebody sure they have eternal life. I said, how do you know you have eternal life? He says, I'm an organist in my church. He said, I'm, I was elected organist. I've been the organist for the past 30 years in my church. My friend, that's very sad. It's very laughable almost, isn't it? That somebody thinks that playing an organ is going to get them into heaven. Nobody plays organs. Organ. <laughs> I think there will be more organ music in hell than heaven, but that's my personal opinion. <laughs> I'm just sorry for injecting my humor there. I hate organs. <laughs> so... <laughs> Oh, that was mean, wasn't it? I'm sorry, organ people. I'm trying to be sorry. I'm trying really hard to, to regret what I said. I'm not an organ fan. Okay. <laughs> not even an organ donor. I'm no, <laughs> in, our, in our church's music manual, we have written, there will never be organ music in Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church so long as Pastor Price is pastor. It's in, it's in our official documents, in our music in our music. Uh, manual. I'm just telling you, it's, it's true, isn't it, Charlie? It's really there, isn't it? Somebody read, actually read our music manual one time. They said, "What is this about the organ? I'm like the organ's terrible. Like, oh, you hate it anyway." <laughs> all right. This dear man, this dear soul, in all seriousness, believe. I mean, honestly, believe that because of the office that he held, which I guess is an important thing. We don't make much about that sort of thing in our church, but the fact that he was the elected organist in his church meant that, in his mind, he was going to go to heaven. meant that his sins were inconsequential and that the good deed of playing the organ in his church justified him, made him righteous before God. And my friend, that's silly, isn't it? Actually. Can you imagine trying to respond to a traffic citation the same way? <laughs> Why are you pulling me over? <laughs> I'm an organist. <laughs> I'm going to heaven for it. You know, you've got a lot of nerve trying to condemn me for breaking the law. For you understand that judges don't judge good, they judge evil. The judge never judges good, judge always judges evil. And uh, we will not be judged by God for our righteousness. We'll be judged for our sin. And the Bible says by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. By the law is the knowledge of sin. So Jesus said... I want to tie this together. I don't want to be too disjointed today. Jesus said, Think not, not, stay in Galatians, but He said in Matthew, Think not that I am come to destroy the law. I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And the point that Jesus is making is that no one has ever fulfilled the law. No one has ever kept the law. See, Jesus Christ fulfilling the law is what gave Him the right or what qualified Him to be the sacrifice a perfect sacrifice for sin. There's a neat story, a Civil War story actually, of a man who died in the place of another man. You guys ever hear the story? You can, look, you can Google it and find the information on it. I always forget the details and the names. But there was a man who was guilty of leading an uprising against the North. And in order to kind of put it down quickly, they ordered him to be sentenced to a firing squad. There were a bunch of people that would have done what the man had done. I can't remember what he did. I think it was some kind of vandalism or some kind of damage. And so they wanted to make him a public example and they were going to have him executed by a firing squad. And when he was getting ready to be executed by the firing squad, another man said, stop, wait a minute, before they fired. And uh, he, came to, he came and spoke to, I don't remember if it was a general, he spoke to whoever's in charge of the firing squad. And he said this, he said, I did not do what that man did. He said, but in my heart, I'm just the same because I would have done the very same thing. If you're going to make an example of him, he has a wife and he has children. I don't have a wife. I don't have children. And so if you will please allow me for the example of these people to die in that man's place. And they actually did. So they actually covered his face and, and uh, they you know, did the ready, aim, fire. And that man died in the place of the other man. There's a tombstone. There's a grave where that man uh, was elect, was uh, buried, and uh, there's the whole story about the man who someone witnessed at that tombstone saying, you know, he took my place, he died in my place. Well, that illustration is a good illustration of one man dying for another, but it's not a good illustration of a perfect man dying for an imperfect one. 
Because the reality of it is that what that man said that he had done it was the exact same thing that the man who was dying had done. In other words, it was one sinner who was allowed to die for another sinner. And that was not the circumstance that Jesus died in, my friend. Now, this is so vital. This is so vitally important. The fact that Jesus came to fulfill the law distinguishes or separates Him from us in every way. The fact that Jesus is the first person to fulfill the law sets Him apart from us in every way. My friend, this does not make us more like Jesus. It makes us less like Jesus, realizing that Jesus came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus did not nullify or make the law which was good null and void. Jesus fulfilled it and then died because we did not. Jesus wants to help His disciples to understand His attitude toward the law. You know, it's kind of popular, isn't it, today to preach, quote, liberty as the annihilation of the law. That is, God God does not hold us accountable for His law. There is no law for those who are believers. And Jesus here is expressly stating, that is not what I came for. Sometime, uh, take the time to read Romans 13, Romans 14, Romans 15. Read about, uh, read about uh, the weaker brother. Read about uh, doing things like eating meat offered to idols and read the actual conclusion. Sometimes read Acts chapter 15 and read about meat offered to idols and the commandments for the Gentiles. And you'll see that God's attitude never was to nullify the law. God's attitude toward the law was just that no one could ever fulfill it, but Jesus could. So here we are in Galatians chapter 2, and one of the things that Paul is explaining later on to the church of Galatians, something we need to understand, is that first of all, a man is not justified by the deeds of the law. It is so silly for a person to say, I'm going to be justified or I'm righteous enough to have access to God because of the works that I've done. The Bible says by the deeds or the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. The law doesn't make a person righteous. The law diagnoses a person as unrighteous. In other words, it doesn't have anything to say about a person who keeps it, but it has condemnation to say about a person who breaks it. So we could go today and we could spend some time, and that's not how I preach the gospel. The gospel is preached that Jesus died in our place, but the, the understanding of what Jesus died for does come from the truth, from the fact that we have violated, that we have broken God's law. So it's important for us to understand, even we, Paul said, we who are Jews by the flesh, he said, and he's talking to Judaizers in the church. In other words, Jewish individuals who are trying to make the Gentiles come under the jurisdiction of the law. And he said, we never fulfilled the law. How can you expect them to fulfill the law? That's Paul's point. Because we never kept the law. We were saved by believing of faith. They were saved by believing of faith. Faith in what? Faith in the fact that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and then died for sin. When you ask the question, and every Christian ought to have a clear understanding of the answer to this question. When you ask the question, why did Jesus come? You ought to know the answer of it. Why did Jesus come? To die for our sins. Why else? What? To fulfill the law. Yeah. Jesus came to, if you want to make a statement, you want to write, you know, a Baptist catechism. <laughs> Don't ever do that. Uh, this is this is our doctrinal statement right here. If you're a Baptist, this is your book. This is this is your confession. This is your creed. Okay. If you're going to write a catechism on Jesus came, Jesus came to fulfill the law and to die for sinners. You could say that about Jesus, couldn't you? It's one of the statements he's making to his disciples. Don't you guys misunderstand my attitude toward the law? I'm not here to destroy the law. I'm not here to nullify the law. I'm here to fulfill the law. And then let's look at the purpose or the application of the law to ourselves as believers. You guys understand that? You understand that Jesus didn't destroy the law? All right, let's look at something now. Uh, go to chapter 3, if you will, please. Just look over in Galatians chapter 3. There's a whole discourse by Paul about trying to be saved by works. And uh, the illustration is that Abraham was saved by faith, the same as he says to the church at Rome. Look at verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So how is a person, how is a person justified? By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. That's what Paul keeps saying in Romans. In verse 11, 
Galatians 3, he said, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not in two seeds as of many, but as of one, and thy seed which is Christ. And Paul said in verse 17, This I say that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, after what? After God's covenant with Abraham. The law which came 430 years after God's covenant with Abraham cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And it's always a good point when somebody thinks that works save. When you go back to Genesis chapter 15, when the Bible says, Abraham believed God and his faith was counted in for righteousness. How is a man made righteous? By the law or by faith? By faith. By faith in what? By faith in the one who would fulfill the law. And, and Paul said 430 years before the law was written, and God made a promise to Abraham. And the promise, the covenant God made, was, was put into effect not by the law, but by faith. And if it were by if it were by the law, it would no longer be a promise. It's the illustration. I know that this is wordy. I know maybe for some it, it's a little much today. But I want to ask the question that's asked in verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? Well, it was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Who's the seed uh, for uh, the promise of Abraham? Jesus. Jesus is. My friend, Jesus is the seed. The seed of what? Well, that word seed is used in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 and 16, the seed of the woman. See, scientifically, that's impossible, isn't it? The seed doesn't come from the woman. The seed comes from a man. It's a miraculous promise of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ made the first moment man ever sinned. It's always been something that people who have looked to God by faith have believed in is the promise of the one who would come to fulfill the law. So what is the purpose of the law then? Does the law have a purpose? Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. What's the purpose of the law? Well, simply put this way, the Bible says in verse... Um, well, where's the schoolmaster? Verse 25. Um, let's just read, read verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Okay, so is the law against God's promise? No, but the law doesn't make us righteous. But the Scripture, verse 22, hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. And here's where we want to come to, verse 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. Okay. What's the purpose of the law in a person's life? The purpose of the law is actually to show us what we are. That we're sinners. Just read through the law sometime and ask yourself how you rate. Just read through it sometime and read how you read. Actually, in, in uh, actually, let's go back to Matthew chapter six, if you will, please, if you'll permit. Uh, we were in Matthew chapter five. I believe where I want to go is Matthew six. How do we how do we stand as far as the law goes? Verse chapter five. I meant to say verse twenty seven. Look at this. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Where was that said at? Exodus twenty. Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy. And that's part of the what? It's part of the law, right? So it's said in the law. I'm not asking for the chapter and verse. It's said in Moses' law, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. I don't need to get crude or crass or anything like that here today except to say you're all adulterers. It's the reality of it. Everybody here is an adulterer according to what Jesus' standard of the law is. In verse 29, the Bible says, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that if one of thy, member, that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, uh, cut it off and cast it from thee. Look at verse 31. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Jesus said, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, 
causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Verse 33, again, you've heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Is Jesus' standard lower or higher than the law's standard? Jesus' standard of lust, is it lower or higher? Higher. higher? higher. Jesus' standard of adultery, is it lower or higher? higher. Jesus' standard of swearing, is it lower or higher? higher? Higher. My friend, I want to say to you that Jesus, my friend, is not a person that we look at and we look at him as this cool hippie dude who is just one with sinners, just like the sinners. No, my friend, Jesus was very, very separated from the sinners because He's the one person who ever lived who was able to fulfill God's law, which none of us could come close to. It has written much far less uh, than the way that Jesus' standard was, which was greater than the law's standard. We get that? We understand that today? Then it ought to have great application for us, shouldn't it? Jesus is speaking to His disciples and He's trying to help them with His orientation class on how to think as a disciple. And He said, think not. Don't be thinking from the terms of I came to fulfill the law, but to destroy it. Now let me just get real practical here today. How are we doing as disciples of the Lord Jesus when it comes to His purpose in coming? You know, I'm afraid today that at large, by and large, the church is far more focused with being culturally relevant, that is worldly, relevant to the world, then the church is concerned with the fact that Jesus Christ had a higher standard than the law itself. Now, I am not here today trying to be so pharisaical as to think that our righteousness could get us anything. Matter of fact, look what Jesus said about righteousness in this same text. In verse 20, He said, For I say unto you, uh, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees do get a bad rap, don't they? And the scribes, don't they get a bad rap? They were the best people alive. They were pharisaical, they were hypocritical in the fact that they were very, very careful about appearance and very unconcerned with what they were in their heart. Jesus called the Pharisees whited sepulchers. You remember that? He said, you're like a fancy painted sepulcher. Outside, you know, you're whitewashed, you're just a beautiful thing. And on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You're rotten inside, you're beautiful on the outside. And my friend, that's the last thing we need in the church house, isn't it? bunch of whited, pharisaical sepulchers. We don't need people that look Christian. We need people that are born again. We don't need people that know how to dress like a believer, know how to talk, Christian talk. We need believers that are what they are claimed to be on the outside, on the inside. You know, I'm far, I, I just like people to be real, don't you? It frustrates me when people... Uh, <laughs> it's, I always think how silly this is, but sometimes people try to impress me. Now, if you knew me well, you wouldn't try to impress me. First of all, because you realize that guy's not worth impressing. And then the second reason would be because you probably know you're not going to impress him. You know, an unimpressive guy is not impressed by much. You know, it's sort of like casting your pearls before swine if you try to impress me. I won't know, I won't be educated enough to be impressed by you. You know what I'm talking about? I just, just don't have a very good part of that in me. Uh, but sometimes people do. You know, sometimes I, I hate it when people when we start a conversation this way because it just gets so derailed that it takes a long time to get back to the point. When somebody finds out, for instance, that I'm a pastor, what do you do? You know, you're just meeting, you're sitting next to somebody out playing. What do you do? Uh, I get up in the morning, I eat breakfast, drink coffee. No, I mean, what do you do for work? Oh, I'm a pastor. Oh, you know, God is everything to me. You ever heard this? Like I just, I mean, I just think about God all the time. You know, I just like, I just, you know, I sort of. Let me tell you about something that happened to me one time. And next thing they want you to know, they're a prophetess or a prophet, and like, you know, just this spiritual aura is just buzzing off of them. You know, and just like, you know, just want to let you know that they're very, very spiritual. 
You know, and if, if they hadn't found out you're a pastor, they wouldn't try. It's just front. You, ever, you know what I'm talking about? You ever had somebody do that to you? About something they want to let you know, hey, you know, <laughs> you know, me and God. You know, this kind of thing. It's like, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> don't laugh at my jokes. You know, I'll keep going. You know, we're not going to get out of here. All right, so. The reality of it, though, my friend, is that the Pharisees were actually impressive people. They actually did try to keep the law as opposed to people that had no regard for the law. I mean, you want to compare the two. I mean, it's great to say, oh, you know, the publican smote his breast and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. But the publican had done some pretty terrible things. He was a sinner. I'd rather have a Pharisee for a neighbor than a publican, wouldn't you? Just being honest about it. I don't want a guy that's crooked and dishonest and doesn't care about what's right and what's wrong and doesn't live by a moral standard. Give me people that have a moral standard for neighbors. They'll be better neighbors, won't they? What are better citizens of a country? People that are under a law and try to obey it and are kind of proud of the fact that they obey it? Or people that are lawless? It doesn't matter if you lock your doors, if you have lawless people, right? Lawless people are devious. They've got all their ways. Now, I realize that the Pharisee, Pharisees were hypocritical, but Jesus said something pretty, uh, a pretty big eye-opener to the disciples. And He said, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not in no wise going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. You don't stand a chance. Now, is Jesus saying that it's righteousness that gets people into the kingdom of heaven and the scribes and Pharisees just aren't righteous enough? Is that his point? Does Jesus ever teach the gospel of be more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees? Is that ever his point? No, it absolutely isn't his point. It's a hyperbole. It's an exaggeration. Jesus is saying if you think it's your righteousness, if you think that my fulfilling the law is insignificant because of your ability to fulfill or to keep it versus mine, you don't stand a chance of being part of the kingdom of heaven. And the fact of the matter is the disciples didn't begin to measure up to the Pharisees and scribes, actually. And neither do I. And could we say neither do we? And that's why we needed a Savior who came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. I would challenge us, though, as believers, to understand the purpose of the law. Much as Paul said, it's a schoolmaster. Righteousness comes how? Does it come by the hearing of the law or by the believing of faith? Mm -hmm. It comes by faith. Faith in whom? The one who was righteous enough to fulfill the law. And that needs to be the mindset of a disciple. Jesus is not putting down. He's not destroying. He's not putting away the law. He's simply saying, you don't measure up. No one measures up, but I do. And so I'm going to fulfill the law for you. And Jesus Christ, my friend, is the fulfilling of the law for us. Now let's get practical about that in two ways, shall we? You're here this morning and you don't know Jesus for your Savior. It isn't complicated. There isn't some good work that you can do. You can play the organist 24-7 and, and play the organist, play the organ 24-7 and you won't get to heaven. And you most likely, it'll encourage you to go the other direction. You can try and keep laws you can make extra rules and laws as the Pharisees, and my friend, it won't justify you. Because the law doesn't justify, it condemns, it shows your need for a Savior. Or you can look to the one who is the fulfilling of the law and believe by faith in Jesus. Do we say what Jesus did? Jesus fulfilled the law and then Jesus died for sin in our place. So then Jesus is the fulfilling of the law for those who believe in Him. Here's how the Bible puts the Gospel or believing in Jesus. Here's how it's just simply summarized. Jesus said it to Nicodemus, you can find this in John 3, He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Literally, in the same way that the children of Israel, when they were bitten by a venomous serpent, could look at that snake on a stick in the middle of the camp and not die, just because they looked, you and I can look to Jesus. Though we're bitten, though we're condemned by the law as sinners, 
we can look at Jesus who died on the cross for sin. And believing in Him, the Bible says, we will not perish but have eternal life. And my friend, I just want to tell you something. Keeping the law is impossible, but believing in Jesus is unbelievably simple. It is so easy that Jesus said that a child can do it and you've got to do it like a child does. Jesus told Nicodemus, He said, you don't know where heaven is and you sure don't know how to get there. But I came from heaven and I'll get you there. You hear this morning, this is, this is how I believed in Jesus. Believing by faith. I just prayed a prayer as a child and, and uh, just said something like, God, I know I'm a sinner. You know you're a sinner. I don't have to talk about what you've done. I don't know what you've done. It doesn't matter to me. But you've broken the law. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died on the cross for my sin and I'm asking you to save me because He fulfilled the law and died on the cross. Believing of faith. <laughs> Literally, the asking is believing. Did you hear me this morning? There's no magic in a prayer. There's no combination of words that you can say that God will say, wow, that's the code. It's just the heart to believe in Jesus, to say, God, I can't, but you can. I want Jesus to be my Savior. And my friend, if you'll do that, God will save you because He says He will. It won't be what you've done, it'll be what He's done. Because Jesus Christ is fulfilling the law. That's the first group here today. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus for your Savior, you can just that easily. God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want to be saved. You can say, I mean, just, I want to be saved, understanding that truth. And God knows your heart. He knows what belief is. And you've believed. You're a disciple of the Lord Jesus. You know, I think we should take this matter of holiness seriously. Oughtn't we? As a disciple of Jesus, you and I ought to take the matter of how we live for Him very, very seriously because Jesus' standard of the law was that not only did He fulfill the law, but His standard was a greater or higher one than ours. And that's our message this morning. And the invitation this morning is identical to that. I'm actually going to close in a word of prayer in just a moment. We're not going to have a pianist play today. We're not going to have a come forward or go back invitation this morning. I'm just going to have a simple invitation. I'm going to invite you uh, to respond while I pray. So I do want to ask when I begin to pray that everyone would just bow their heads and close their eyes and like every person here to have a private time without anyone looking around or looking on uh, to, to see even the person next to you. And let's, let's pray. God, I just ask, Lord, that you would just have your way in us. Lord, we recognize this morning that no one could fulfill the law, but that it's by believing of faith that individuals are made righteous. And so I pray that you would help us to not only believe you, but God, I pray that if there's any person here today that doesn't know Jesus for their Savior, the day would be the day of salvation. Here this morning, and you'd say, well, Pastor, I've never understood salvation like that. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, nobody looking around, you'd say, Pastor, I've never understood salvation like that. But if it's as simple as believing in Jesus, I couldn't keep the law, but I could believe in Jesus who fulfilled the law. And God showed me something today I never realized before, and I want to be saved. I want to pray uh, for God to save me. If that's you, just slip your hand up. No one looking around. I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you for anything, but just slip your hand up. Put it right back down. You can just pray and say, God... I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus died for my sins and I'm asking you to save me. If you do that, God will. You hear this morning you say, Pastor, you know, sometimes I've bought into this idea that Jesus came to destroy the law. The disciples even thought that, so I guess I'm in pretty good company. But they were wrong and so am I. I don't have the arrogance to think that my righteousness could exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. But God's put His finger on some things in my life that are matters of holiness and matters of taking the law seriously. And I, I need a bit of a schoolmaster even as a believer. Actually, the way I've lived it hasn't been remarkably different from the way a lost person's lived. And God showed me the importance of the law as a schoolmaster today. And the fact that Jesus fulfilled it makes me want to live in light of His holiness. I've made a decision today about some things that I'm going to give to God. And would you pray for me? If you just slip your hand up, just slip it up so I can pray for you up and just slip them right back down. Okay? Anyone else? Just slip them right up, right back down. Okay? Anyone else? Before I finish my prayer this morning, would you commit that to God? Would you just do business with Him? Would you just tell Him what you've shared with me?
God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for the clarity of it. Lord, as we begin the next several weeks of even continuing to look at this matter of discipleship from your word, I pray that you would grant to us great understanding of what's required of disciples. Help us to make that choice, that decision to be a disciple. God, for any person that's believed on Jesus today, I pray that your Holy Spirit, as he comes into them to witness their salvation, would just thrill their heart and their soul. Help them to know how to live and how to grow. Just ask that you would just bless this invitation now. Help us with the truth of it, to be honest with you, and to keep our word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your good attention this morning. I realize things are unusual. We didn't have a pianist for our invitation. We did some things a little bit differently, but that's good for us sometimes because we don't do things out of tradition or because it's the religious way. We want to be thinking on doing things on purpose, and so... It's good sometimes to get a little out of a routine, I think. Let me just conclude today by uh, thanking you for being here. For folks that are visiting back with us today, good to have you. Glad that you've come. If you're visiting for the first time today, again, we're thankful for you being here. And uh, so glad that God brought you. Our heart is to be a help to anybody that we can. And so if we could help you in any way with spiritual matters, if the message today brought up some questions, and you'd say, Pastor, now I've got questions. Well, we've got a book that has all the answers, and, and you're important. We value you. We've got time to find those answers with you, and I'd be honored if you'd ask your questions. So feel free to do that. And also, if I can do anything else for you, I just count it an honor to be your pastor. I just, I'll just be honest with you. God humbles me many times by just thinking of how unworthy I am to get to pastor the church that I get to pastor. I really believe that you're the best people in the world. And uh, just just so thankful that God has given you uh, to this church and given me the opportunity to serve you. And I hope you know that I'm your servant and I would like to serve you in any capacity I possibly can. God bless you. You're dismissed. You have a great day.